Hey, this is Warren Redlick. I'm here with Brian Wong from Next Big Future. We're going to talk about Tesla, 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 Tesla. I'm wearing the Tesla Man t-shirt that you can get at elonbits.com. You can find out more about Brian at Next Big Future. I'll put links in the video description below. We're going to talk about Tesla's 2023 production and deliveries. That was what inspired the conversation. Brian sent me a DM. We were talking about it. Since then, there's been a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Brian wants to talk about semi and cyber truck. So we're going to cover what we see for the future of semi and cyber truck. We're going to talk about the next generation vehicle, which is something I want to talk about, particularly what was disclosed in the master plan about the size of the battery. We got Giga Mexico. Where else are they going to build that next generation vehicle? We're going to talk about FSD beta. I drove the latest version of FSD beta this morning. I've noticed big improvement for me and my drives. And we're going to talk about the Megapack Mega Factory in Shanghai and where else and what else that means for Tesla. Are you ready? Let's go. Oh my God, that's a lot of stuff. Brian. Yes. You messaged me about yeah. 2023 production and deliveries. Yeah. And I I'm seeing numbers that Tesla might only deliver 1.8 million or less. Like, you know. I think Troy Tesla is projecting less than 1.8 million deliveries. <clears throat> I tend to be optimistic about deliveries and production. And I look and I, it seems like in particular, my issue is it seems like Giga Shanghai is holding back and mm -hmm. Giga free and Tesla Fremont doesn't seem to be growing. Berlin and Texas are growing. There's no question about that. They are increasing production, but for some reason, it seems like Shanghai is holding back. So I, I, I want to believe 2 million is going to happen. Mm -hmm. What we have 427 million deliveries in Q1? 427,000. Uh, yeah, it would, um, 427,000. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. not million. Yeah, yeah. And in and order 4,400 production, 445,000 production. So in order to get to 2 million, and you're saying it's going to be higher than 2 million, Tesla has to average, I think I worked out the number, they have to average more than 500,000 a quarter for mm -hmm. the next three quarters. Some of the people who are talking about this are projecting, you know, 450,000 deliveries. And so you're, that means the last two quarters have to be even bigger. So how do you get to over 2 million deliveries? All right, what do you see for deliveries and how do you see them getting there for 2023? I'm viewing it based upon, as you said, that the Shanghai is holding back, right? So we say Shanghai holding back because they've had um, uh, months and, and quarters, months where they delivered um, like 80, 85,000 um, vehicles in, in a month. So we know that they can build at that rate. So that means that a all out quarter would be about 255,000, 260,000 vehicles, right? So um, before we were saying, oh, you know, we want to, you know, when Tesla can make uh, a certain rate, then they go all out and they're, and they're selling every vehicle they make and they're, and they're totally pegged, right? So um, based on the, uh, numbers of like, okay, you can make 88,000 vehicles um, per month in Shanghai. You can make um, 150,000 vehicles in Fremont. You can make um, in, in the Q1 about 3,000 vehicles um, per day um, on average uh, for, sorry, 300 vehicles per week in each of the uh, Berlin and Austin. So it's about like uh, 13 weeks. So about 39,000, right? So that would be, so. 39, 3, 000, 39. 3,000 a week. 3,000 a week, yeah. So 39,000 per quarter. So 39,000, 39,000. So like 80,000 total there. You have the 260 and, and the 160. So let me just get that number together. 160. Wait, I've, got, I've got Berlin at 5,000 a week and I've got Texas at 4,000 a week and they're both growing. Wait, about the Q2, but the average for Q1. Yeah. Because they didn't hit 4,000, 5,000 until the end of the, of the quarter. Right? right. So the average capability within Q1 with 3,000, uh, with, with 3,000, roughly, right? That, that'd be my estimate. I might say a little basically... more, but we'll go with 3,000 for this conversation, sure. Right, right. So, so 260, 150, so 230. So basically about 490K, if they were all pegged out, right? That's how much they could make in from those from those factories, right? But you, as they say, though, in Q1, they were holding back in... in um, in Shanghai in particular, right? Because of, you know, two weeks shutdown, um, you know, retooling, whatever. Holiday, whatever. Yeah. Low demand, some low demand, right? So 
but they didn't reprice things. So basically, if you go at um, at the four twenty ish, then they're basically at eighty percent of of that four ninety number, right? But I'm saying I'm thinking that ten percent of that was because of the abnormal circumstances within Q one, right? That you have one, it's two days shorter because of February, right? And then the other issue is that you had that two week shutdown thing, right? So I'm thinking get what ten percent of that back in a normal quarter. And then the pricing that people are looking at is saying, okay, I'm gonna cut pricing to maximize production, which is what Elon said. So I'm thinking they can hit 90% of what the capacity is in Q2 and Q3, Q4, right? That's my general thesis of how they get there. And they will adjust pricing to push those vehicles out, right? That, that's the cuts that we've been seeing, right? So then um, in Q2, the production capacity of Shanghai stays the same. Fremont stays roughly the same, although a, there was talk about them upping that, you know, by about 10, 20 percent. Well, but Elon, we have, Elon said it's growing. Right. It says it's growing. Right. So you, it could be a 5 percent there. Um, we can put that in. And then um, for uh, Austin and Berlin, we hit the 5,000, 4,000 at the beginning. And it's taking about a month um, uh, for each to move up about 1,000. It goes 27 days to move up from like 4,000 to 5,000 to Berlin. And then Austin could be hitting that number too. So let's let's go with that just to, to have the numbers. So that means you would end up with 3,000 more per week at the end. So 8,000, 7,000, or 8,000, 8,000 if Austin catches up. So that means throughout Q2, you'd be averaging about 1,500 better than the start of, of the 5,000, 4,000. So we're saying uh, 6,500 uh, for Berlin and 5,500 for Austin. That's 11,000 um, per week. Have 13. Have 13. So that's um, 143. So 143, uh, as we said, the um, the 410 capacity for for Fremont and, um, and uh, Shanghai stayed the same. So then we're looking at 593, roughly. Wow. Right? So that's a, the the capacity, the capacity there. So you take 90% of that and you end up at 550, 540. 540. Uh, so right. yeah, 530, 530. Right, 530. Right. And and thing is, I'm not saying this is like a precise thing. It could be like- And then, and then Q4 know. is a similar jump to maybe- Close to six hundred, right? Right. To, to actually to well over six hundred. Well, for the capacity would go up to like six sixty. Could it be both the um, right? The actual is, production would be close to six hundred, right? And that gets you. I, I'm not sure that gets you enough though. So if we at uh, five, uh, let's say five thirty to, to get to two million is what I'm saying. Yeah. If so add, if you add six hundred plus five forty, you get eleven forty, and then you add the nine hundred or so. A little less than nine hundred for the first two quarters. Well, significantly less than nine hundred. No, for the first no. I'm you don't saying get the two million. I'm I'm saying over nine hundred for two quarters. I'm saying five thirty for Q two, right? Five thirty for Q two. So then four twenty seven. That'd be like nine fifty seven. Oh, you're saying Q two gets over five hundred? Yeah, I'm saying Q two gets over five hundred. If it's if it's at nine percent, if it's not, oh, you're 9%. saying Q three is six hundred and then Q four is even more. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I, because so, of the capacity thing. So I think, I think, so we can get there. So in other words, if we do 530, 600 and 650 or something like that, we very clearly get to over 2 million. Right. Right. That's production. You take out the last few weeks that you're going to deliver because they're on, they're in transit. Right. You're probably over 2 million deliveries. So it seems like others in the Tesla community, Troy mm -hmm. Tesla like being the most prominent one and the, and who's got a history of being pretty accurate. Right, right, right. I yeah, think right. demand isn't there and Shanghai is going to keep holding back. Right. So what's right. your take? And I, I tend to, you know, Elon has said, we're not going to hold back because of demand. We'll just lower prices. But Elon can say that, but they certainly seem to have held back in first quarter. Right, so right. What, what's, how, what are we supposed to believe about, you know, how Tesla is going to respond? Is there a lack of demand in China? Can that lack of demand be met by lowering prices? 
Are there other markets they can sell Shanghai produced vehicles to and lower prices in those markets like Australia? I mean, Australia is a small market, so I don't see that doing it. Europe mm -hmm. is getting more of its cars from Berlin. Mm -hmm. Where are they selling these Shanghai built cars and how are they getting them sold? I mean, I don't know. Would Japan take Shanghai built cars? Because Japan seems to have a low penetration of Teslas right now. Right. They have a low penetration of Teslas. So, um, you know, the fact that they opened up new markets like um, Malaysia, Thailand, that's only a few thousand vehicles. It yeah. seems to take some time to get the market penetration that you're talking about, right? You know, if there was pent-up demand in Japan, you know, then we would see some kind of like, you know, they they start selling there and they get the backlog and they fill it up, right? So I'm not projecting that that's going to be the case. I think it's, you know, like um, China's, you know, starting off the year, at, you know, 30, 40% um, new energy vehicles or like that. And most of that is the um, electric vehicles. And I think it could get to 50% by the end of the year. In terms of the um, competitive market, you know, there, if they were to get down into the, um, you know, 30,000 flat range or $29,000 flat range after whatever subsidy in China, I think that they would be taking out, you know, BYD, Neo, whatever other vehicles are, well, it's probably not Neo, but, you know, like um, whatever the, the, um, hose on or whatever, you know, the, the vehicles in that lower price segment, right, which have more sales, because you see those sales from BYD, and also you see them from, you know, people who would say, I, I would buy a lower price Tesla, and I won't buy a gasoline or a hybrid vehicle or something like that, right? So they can suck those sales out if they go into the lower market. I think it's about twice as big. Like if, they, if they go from 40000 and up, where Tesla's most been playing, down into that, you know, 30000 some range, I think it's like you go from 20% of the market to 50% of the market at that. So there's another 30% there. So by dropping down, you can get a more than double of their size. So they already have reduced prices quite a bit, and they may have to drop another 5,000. So the question is, you know, so the if they're still making 20%, you know, um, on, their, on their margin, right? And then that's... Um, you know, eight thousand, ten thousand uh, dollars per vehicle still, right? Then dropping that down on their lowest price vehicles, another ten percent, you know, from thirty thousand to twenty seven thousand. I think they can get there. Um, but you know, does that mean they drop margin at fifteen percent in order to move those vehicles in China, right? Um, the two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars is how much it costs to ship the vehicle someplace else. Right. And then if you have import duties and stuff like that, then it all goes away. Plus, because of the, as Troy Seth like says, the production increase in Berlin means that you're you're satisfying your Europe demand with um Europe made vehicles. Right. So each of those factories mostly is going to be sticking onto their continent, like selling in Asia and topping that up. But basically it's going to be price cuts, right? If they're going to sell these vehicles, they have to cut price because uh, China had like 130k domestic deliveries. So in order to move those, to to say, I'm going to go from 220,000 up to 260,000, right? Um, then I need to sell 170,000, 180,000 vehicles inside of China to get that demand. So basically that means another round of price cuts for, for, uh, for China. Well, and we've seen, we've seen BYD sales suffer. Mm -hmm. I, I think other Chinese EV makers might suffer. I think gas car production, gas car companies will suffer. I mean, the no. question is sort of like, how big is the market in China? Are they in some kind of recession that's suppressing demand? It seems like there's a global suppression of demand to buy vehicles right now. Mm -hmm. Not just, I mean, Tesla's growing, but mm -hmm. it's not growing as fast as we like. Other car companies are taking big hits. Right. You know, Honda, I think, dropped 33% sales in, in the United States in 2022. That's probably the worst one, but... Um, we're sort of in this weird situation where the economies, not just the United States economy, but the global economy seems to be slow. I'd like to be optimistic and say it's going to pick up, but I'm not super confident about that. Um, but For China, your, your point is just, we're just in this point where the, the, the Tesla mini bulls, I'll say the, mm -hmm. the, the, the regular bulls, you and I are hyper bulls. 
Mm -hmm. Regular bulls think that Tesla will not increase production if the demand isn't there. And you and I think, well, Elon said they're just going to make more cars and they'll sell them at, you know, at, at, you know, no profit if they have to, to get as many cars out there, which we'll talk about FSD in a minute. The more car, if, if FSD is going to cross a threshold where all of a sudden it's safer than human and it's acknowledged as safer than human and the robo taxi network lights up, mm -hmm. you want as many cars out there as possible mm -hmm. that are capable of operating as robo taxis because the value is going to 5X mm -hmm. and Tesla is going to make money off operating the robo taxi fleet and the more mm -hmm. vehicles that are out there. And, and then the, when it crosses that threshold, all the people who own Teslas that don't have FSD will say, wait a minute, now I want it. Mm -hmm. it can be, you can leave out the robo taxi fleet for a second and just say anybody who has a Tesla that's capable of full self-driving, mm -hmm. if full self-driving crosses the threshold to where it's safer than human and it works every, you know, almost everywhere, Mm -hmm. the 95% of buyers in China might all of a sudden be willing to pop off 15 or 20 grand for FSD. Mm -hmm. And that's all bonus revenue. Mm -hmm. And the more vehicles you have out there, the more revenue that generates. Yeah. So, but you're, how do you reconcile the, I mean, maybe there is no reconciliation, but you've got the, the, the mini bulls who aren't really, who aren't as bullish as you and me who say, they're not going to, they're going to throttle production in Shanghai because the demand isn't there. How do you balance that? So, so one thing is um, my 90% of capacity thing is that I'm only expecting them to price a bit more aggressively and shove out 20,000 more cars in, in China. So they're pricing, you know, 80%, sorry, pricing moved 80% of the cars with that two week shutdown. So if they just, produce normally, don't have shutdowns, then, and the pricing of the US fine tune it a bit, then they get to 240,000 produced and then exported. That means you're, you're putting 150,000 cars into the China domestic market. They need to just, you know, make sure they can move 20,000 more, more cars, which is, I think, fine tuning $1,000 here or there, maybe $1,500 on the pricing that you get there. And then the main thing is I'm saying that they'll, Fully ramp, you know, you know, nearly fully ramp the um, Austin Berlin, you know, getting to you know roughly eight thousand per week at the end of the the quarter, and then they move all those vehicles. So they have to then cut prices a bit more in in Europe. So I don't think it's that aggressive a, a pricing cut to get to move those vehicles. I think Europe is a big question mark. I think U.S. with the um, uh, IRA and other things, they can move those additional. Um, Going from forty thousand or so in Austin up to, uh, five, six times thirteen, so you know, eighty eighty thousand. So you know, roughly eighty thousand vehicles. So next to forty thousand vehicles from 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 Austin. So I think the U.S. can absorb that. And again, it's it's a matter of just adjusting the pricing. So yeah, that's that's my my belief is they they will adjust the pricing and they will move the extra 40,000 vehicles from Europe, 40,000 vehicles from Austin, 20,000 vehicles from um, from China, that they'll move those into the, the markets that they're in. If they can, like say, get another 5,000 vehicles out to Japan or other places in Asia, that makes it easier to meet their uh, China numbers. Yeah, it just seems like Japan, for those who don't know, Japan is the third largest car market in the world after the United States, after China and the United States. And the fourth largest, if you say China, North America, and Europe, mm -hmm. and then Japan falls behind Europe, but still a very mm -hmm. large car market and a very wealthy, relatively speaking, car market. Um, I think the Model 3 and Model Y are a little bit big for Japanese roads and Japanese consumers, but, you know, it's not much mm -hmm. bigger than a Camry mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, RAV4 Highlander. So I think there's some potential for it to sell. There are a lot, of, there are a lot of smaller cars in Japan, but still... It seems like Japan could absorb fifty thousand cars a year yeah. more. And if I'm wrong about China, right, and they they go flat, right, that's twenty thousand less. So instead of five twenty, they're five hundred, right. So they could easily disappoint me on that, and and they don't go aggressive. But you know, from my thinking is, if I'm Elon on the team, and I'm saying I want to, to get that stuff, you know, getting to ninety percent of what I know I can do by just you know adjusting the pricing, you know, then I would make that move. And it has to be at the low end price cut for 
Model Y and Model Three to move probably only Model Three really or Model Y because you know the the Y outsells the three like three to one in China. Do you so think? The y. That, well, I mean, I feel like Model Three production has totally plateaued. I don't think we're seeing mm. any growth, any significant growth in Model Three. All the growth is Model Y right now, <clears throat> right? Um, and I think that's you know there's this whole fantasy some people have that there's going to be this project highland that's going to be a total revision of model three and i think they're missing that like i think model s and model x are dying they're, mm -hmm. they're you know they're cool but they're dying i mean it's model s is a spectacular car model x is a great car but they're just not selling in volume they peaked at a hundred thousand several years ago and i don't think they've mm -hmm. sold much more than seventy thousand in a year since and i don't think they're on pace to break seventy thousand this year and it's mm -hmm. because you know tesla's future is in much higher volumes and model three it seems like you know, the sedan market isn't as popular as the SUV market. The Model Y is fundamentally or not. Well, it's actually probably lower cost for Tesla to make a Model Y right now than a Model 3. But even if you redesign mm -hmm. how you made Model 3, um, Model Y would not cost that much more than Model 3. But it sells for significantly more because it has more volume and has more utility for a lot of users. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I like Model 3 for the range because it's lower frontal surface area, better coefficient of drag. Mm -hmm. So it'll get, you know, 30 more miles of range on a highway. Mm -hmm. But it just seems like Tesla's made the decision not to expand Model 3. And I don't see any hint of Tesla saying, all right, we're going to start producing Model 3s in Berlin. We're going to start producing Model 3s in Texas. It's like, we're just building more Model Ys and then Cybertruck's coming. And the the world market doesn't seem to need more Model 3s. Am I missing something? It would have to be, you know, a the Highland would have to be real. They'd have to redesign it, <clears throat> take 5K out. And if they do, then there are sedan type vehicles that uh, BYD is selling, which indicates that you know you could um, take that from the other um, car makers. So there is sales of other um, gas sedans and, and other things, you know, take more of um, of the Camry, whatever market. Right. So there is sales there to be taken. It's a question of like, uh, you know, do you put the effort into making that redesign vehicle? Tesla right. would know. Yeah. No, and the other thought I have, and we're going to talk about the next generation vehicle in a few minutes. The next generation vehicle platform is going to like Model 3 is the low cost car in Tesla's lineup. Mm -hmm. And this next generation vehicle is going to come out and it's going to undercut Model 3. Right. So you know, which vehicle in Tesla's fleet. Now you could argue, well, the, the next generation vehicle takes sales from everybody else, but it might cannibalize sales of Model 3. It would, yeah. And yeah. I mean, I think to improve Model 3, you'd want to do front and rear castings. You'd probably want to do lithium iron phosphate. I don't, and I think the 4680s are spoken for. Yeah. You know, you're not doing structural pack on Model 3. And they're not, you know, I suppose you could, but you'd really have to ramp 4680 production. You need those 4680s for Cybertruck and eventually Semi and and Model Y. I think Model 3 just ends up being a low priority. So this is a there's a question that I've asked people before, and I'm going to ask you this question. Model S and X plateaued around 100,000 vehicles and actually dropped off. It seems like Model 3 is, I think, plateaued around 500,000 vehicles. I don't know what the total number of Model 3 production is, but I don't think it's a lot more than 500,000. And it seems like that sort of hit its peak. And I don't see any any motion from Tesla to increase volume of Model 3 production. Mm -hmm. So the question goes to Model Y. Is there a ceiling? Is there a point where Model Y will plateau? How, you know, how many Model Ys can Tesla sell? And it, it seems like with Model S and Model X, the demand just vanished. Like, it's stunning to me. Just I just want to say, by the way, I drive a Model X Plaid. Um, I think the Model S is a spectacular vehicle. I can't believe you can buy a Model S long range right now for $85,000. And if you go on Tesla's used inventory, you can get a fairly low mileage refresh Model S with FSD for like $75,000. Mm -hmm. Who's buying a BMW seven series or five series or Mercedes S class or E class. The, this is a spectacular vehicle, so much lower mm -hmm. cost to operate so much better driving machine. Mm -hmm. It's stunning to me that they can't get demand to rise for model S and model X. Mm -hmm. And I see that in the future for model Y, is there some point where it's just like, okay, the market can't absorb more of these 
where where's the ceiling for model y is it three million is it four million is it two million how many model y's can they make if the market will continue to buy them so um i think it depends upon the price that they can get to how what how much they can do with the cost of making it right so if they can get you know the cost reduction things that they were looking to do in terms of like um drivetrain you know um thousand dollar drive unit blah 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 that they can get those kind of innovations like some of those innovations like not the um probably the um modular construction at least not initially right um would be difficult to to read the uh the un unboxed process unboxed process right that'd be difficult i think to, to do right especially you know with factories going on the fly so but then certain things like the drivetrain other innovations there um are coming in. So if you say that there's some kind of like five, 10% per year, um, or maybe better, like I think 10% per year cost reduction in 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 their in their cost, which I think was what they they showed that they in their model Y two twenty seventeen versus twenty twenty or something like that, it was roughly a ten percent thing. So if you kept reducing the price by ten percent, then in three years if you're thirty percent cheaper and um the base model Y goes from forty thousand down to thirty thousand, right? then you could get to you know four million vehicles right then you, the that whole addressable market thing that um arc invest has right where they show okay you drop the prices and stuff and you have so much you know double triple demand right so right. at the current pricing we're looking you know we're at this two two and a half million um cap but then if you drop it by 10k over three years then you get to you know five million Right. So it's it does depend upon aggressive pricing to get to the bigger numbers. Um how much do they have to, you know, you know, adjust margins in order to, to make those numbers? But you know, it's like um they have the other models, higher end models where they can make maybe more on it. Um, but it's like um they get the volumes, they have to have the low end drop to about thirty thousand dollars on the model Y. And and they said the, the mall three matters less, but you know if that if we have to be at like twenty five thousand twenty eight thousand to be the, the thing, right? Which when they had their um, um, investor day, you know that was saying, hey, we're reducing all these costs using all these amazing things, right? Yeah. And then, um, but if they have the FSD stuff working and high attachment rates, then they can maintain margins and really drive down the prices. And then they can drop to another ten percent, right, on the um, hardware cost the whole um you know shaver blade thing right to right. get to to that so that I, makes things easier i just want to mention really quick that when i say that there's these you know this plateau for model three you know the model three long range still isn't available on the configurator when you're when you mm -hmm. want to order a tesla model three you can't order a long range model three you can like scour inventory to see if there's one available maybe you can buy a used one in inventory it's mm -hmm. so striking to me that Tesla could sell if like if they just like why aren't they selling Model Three long range? Mm -hmm. Why why is that not available? Like, is it is you know is it that they make more margin on you know they sell the standard range Model Three for so much less, mm -hmm. right? And and the standard range Model Three is only going to get the thirty seven fifty tax credit. The long range Model Three gets the seventy five hundred dollar tax credit. I wonder if we're going to see a shift in a week when the tax credit deal goes through that they finally release the long range model three. I just feel like the long range model three is such an amazing car. You know, it's, it's almost 360 miles of range. Mm -hmm. It's really, I mean, it almost like it, it cannibalizes model S mm -hmm. right. If you want a, a 400 mile range Tesla, you want the model S, but if you can get 360 miles of range out of a model three, you're not far off of a model S and it's a pretty good car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it's actually more, I think it's more efficient in terms of miles per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm surprised we don't see, I, I, where do you see Model 3 long range going? Do you see them eventually offering that again to order? And does that, you know, if they're, if they're struggling to sell Model 3s, can they make Model 3 long range and sell them at a higher price point? At, at a higher price point than standard range, I mean. Right. A struggling, you know, I think they did sell like 550,000 um, um, Model 3s or whatever last year, you know, still like six or 
you know, definitely in the top 10 in terms of um, deal sales. So of, of overall car models. So it's still a, you know, a very, you know, it's only less good relative to the, to the Model Y now. And, and, you know, other car makers would really want to have a Model 3. So I think that um, in terms of the, the vehicle mix issue and whether they make, how good they make the Model 3 long range, as you say, and impact the, the Model S, especially if they're starting to get not, you know, the gap, you know, $80,000, $85,000 uh, S versus a, what, 55, how, how much is the long range uh, Model 3? Uh, Around right? 50,000. 50,000, yeah. So then it's, it's this. And, and the Model 3 gets the tax credit. Right, right. So they have to base sell two of those things for at least every Model S, right, in order to make it something that's. that's right, but Model S, I mean, this is my thing about Model S and Model X. They're basically dying. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just not the long, you know, Tesla's goal is to, you know, get to 20 million vehicles. If Model S and Model X are going to hit their ceiling at 100,000 vehicles a year, they're kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. you know, if you can keep selling them and make a profit on them, you keep selling them and make a profit on them. But at some point, you just don't worry about them anymore. And you make as you sell as many as you can. And don't mm -hmm. let that affect your strategy for the company. Mm -hmm. you know, anyway, all right. So I want to move on. Yep. Um, I have Semi and Cybertruck next on my list, but I... I think this really, what we've just talked about really feeds into the next generation vehicle. So if you're okay with it, let's talk sure. about that. Sure. So we've got Giga Mexico announced. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got the master plan document, the white paper that was released indicated that that class of vehicle would have a 53 kilowatt hour pack. It was really unusual because there was a whole bunch of vehicles, the classes of vehicles that were hundred kilowatt hours or 75 kilowatt hours, which is roughly round numbers. Mm -hmm. And then they specifically said the next generation vehicle platform, that compact class would have a 53 kilowatt hour pack. They didn't say 50. <laughs> is that like a signal that the next generation vehicle platform is going to have a 53 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate pack? So they were talking about the whole world in terms of like uh, all 89 um, million vehicles, right? So the pack sizes and other things, I believe, and also things like um, the cost of factories and, and that kind of stuff. I don't think they were necessarily giving all their own specs. On right. Because they're, they're saying, okay, you know, everyone else is going to make these vehicles. And so they've calculated out that if we get 20%, if we get 30%, whatever these markets, that other guys are going to be doing this, and then we blend it together. So I said, I blend together thing. The other thing is that the 53 is also, they would offer, say, a range, which means like, 35, 40 K kilowatt hour packs and 60 kilowatt hour packs. So I'm I'm reading less into that that is saying we will make these primarily 53. That that'd be our uh, median, you know, average point of, of pack size. Right? Well, let me let me let me just let me just stop you for a second. So number one, my projection for the next generation vehicle platform, the, the smallest battery pack for it would probably be around 40 kilowatt hours. And mm -hmm. I'm expecting, so Model 3 gets about four and a half miles a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So I'm expecting the next generation vehicle with all the efficiency gains, the reduced frontal surface area, reduced coefficient of drag, thousand volt architecture. There's a whole bunch of things that they're doing that will make it more efficient. I'm saying maybe they're shooting for six miles a kilowatt hour. If you do mm -hmm. a 40 kilowatt hour pack, you get 240 miles of range, which is probably not enough for the U.S. market, but it's probably enough for China, Europe, Japan, some other countries. Mm -hmm. So I sort of see like the bottom end vehicle of that platform would be 40 kilowatt hours. If you're doing the United States and it's a 50 kilowatt hour pack and six miles a kilowatt hour, you get to 300 miles of range, which is what Amer what Americans are going to want. Mm -hmm. Americans, you know, it's hard. I mean, they're selling the Model Y, the, the new Model Y all wheel drive from Texas with 4680s at 270 or 280 miles of range. Mm -hmm. They're selling the standard range Model 3 at I think that's around 270 miles of range. Mm -hmm. So there is a market for 270 mile range vehicles. Mm -hmm. Right. But I was just struck by that. And then, the, sorry, the other thing that I struggle with is I think that the Model 3 and Y, when they use lithium iron phosphate, they they struggle to get, I don't know if it's even 60 kilowatt hour packs in those vehicles. Mm -hmm. This next generation vehicle is supposed to be smaller. So how are you, and they said, 
53 kilowatt hours lithium iron phosphate. How are you squeezing a 53 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate battery pack into the same into the space under this next generation vehicle if it's significantly smaller than Model 3 and Y, <clears throat> which right. it pretty clearly will be smaller. Mm -hmm. So are they just making more room under the vehicle relative to everything else so that they can squeeze more batteries in? Or is that, I mean, they said it was going to be battery chemistry agnostic. So maybe there's obviously going to be a nickel based battery pack for that vehicle, probably for the United States. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one, I think there's some, um, you know, the um, iron magnesium batteries that uh, aluminum uh, manganese, whatever batteries that um, lithium CHL's iron phosphate out. doped with manganese to get some additional energy density. Right, about ten percent range. Right, um, so that is an option. But the other thing is that um, for the uh, other competitors, right, they're about twenty percent less efficient, thirty percent less efficient than Tesla. So if Tesla's minimum is forty kilowatt hours, then they're at forty-eight kilowatt hours. Right, in order to get the pricing down there, currently. You cannot do it anything else other than some form of lithium iron, right? The so iron, the iron the iron cathode is less expensive than the nickel cathode. Listen, yeah, the iron cathode lithium is lithium than the cathode. So to get to that those price points, you need to have it. So kind of you're constrained by the technologies <laughs> around that. So um, so the initial phase of that, you know, like the mature market is different because what you know, battery better, be easy to, to do it, all that kind of stuff. But in the initial phase, as we're ramping up the first two, three years, right, then you're, you're, you're facing these drivetrain efficiency battery constraints. It's a big struggle. That's why it's a huge achievement. Okay, we can get to this um, cost reduction, this whatever thing, in order to make the vehicles and make them at 2 million, 4 million units per year, right? So that's also the, the challenge for everyone else that, yes, you have these uh, cheap cars in China, but they got 150 mile range. They got, you know, 180 mile range, right? They're not at the 240, right? So they did it by sucking out batteries. It's just like, I can sell a Pinto for 10 grand, right? But I can't, you know, make a, it takes me $18,000 to make a Camry or, or, or um, um, Corolla, a base and Corolla, right? So that's the, the issue that they have. So I think that um, I would go with the ratios. 25 kilowatt hour pack in that table versus for the model three Y level. And then they had 53 for that. So I would look at the ratio size packs. I would say, okay, if I have whatever size packs for the model three and the model Y, you know, maybe if the model three would be the, if I make a mini model Y, then, you know, maybe that's the comparator thing of saying, okay, what are the pack sizes for my model Ys? And then if it's like 60%, um, 66% the size for my, um, for my baseline car, then I would use that as a way to say what would the pack sizes be. If the current, I, if the current yeah. Model Threes use pack sizes from sixty to eighty-two, sixty right. to eighty, let's say, then the next generation vehicle would use let's say forty to sixty. Right, right, right. So I use the ratios, and then same thing for the ratios for the one hundred kilowatt hour pack for the Cybertruck. I would say, how do I upsize? You know, the 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 Model Y variants up to. The, the Cybertruck variants. I would use those ratios. I wouldn't use the numbers specifically because the numbers are just them trying to size out total terawatt hours needed to convert the world, right? So the, the purpose of that was I'm trying to ballpark the world and they're not trying to say, and I'm going to assume that I get these these things that we're working on technologically, I'm going to factor in and, and revive this model, right? So they're, they're saying conservatively based on roughly the technology we have now, you know, the the um, progress thing is not we're going at the Tesla speed and and moving everything to whatever's going to change. They're saying roughly what we have now, ballpark it, get within a factor of fifty percent of what the global change is going to be, right? And then pricing those. So that was the purpose of that document. And so it's not saying we're revealing accidentally revealed all our secrets of like how we're going to make next gen vehicle and blah blah blah. So that, that's I think so, but. I think the ratio thing is what I would look at. Okay, so just going forward with the next generation vehicle, though, they announced Giga Mexico. Tom Zhu at Investor Day said they're going to build more than one factory at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to build a next generation vehicle factory in Shanghai for sure. I think mm -hmm. they're probably going to build a next generation vehicle factory at Texas or 
somewhere else in the United States and in Berlin or somewhere else in Europe. I don't know when they're going to build these other factories. They've already announced Giga Mexico. I kind of feel like they just haven't told us mm -hmm. when they're going to build the next, you know, the, these other factories or where they're going to build these other factories. It seems I mean, maybe not Austin because there's so much else going on in Austin. And, you know, maybe there's a labor supply issue in Austin. Mm -hmm. And also Austin is so close. To, I mean, there's a, there, I think they said that Giga Mexico would not be selling cars in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And then I think there's this also this question, does the U.S. market have sufficient demand for 2 million of the next generation vehicle? Mm -hmm. if, if the factory that they produce is going to be able to make 2 million vehicles, I'm guessing Giga Mexico is going to sell to Latin America. Right. That's the strategy. And mm -hmm. by the way, just I was curious about this because I'm expecting to get my Cybertruck, you know, in 10 months or so, 8 to 10 months. And I was thinking about going on an adventure down to you know, South America and the superchargers stop in Southern Mexico. Mm -hmm. There's no supercharger network in the rest of Latin America. So Tesla's going to have to start building out superchargers in Latin America if they're going to start. But, you know, the Giga Mexico vehicles aren't going to start for. I mean, they're not starting production until 2024. Right. So they're they're not delivering until mid 2024 at the earliest. Maybe 2025 is when they really deliver in any volume. And I suppose mm -hmm. they can just sell them in Mexico at first where there is a supercharger network. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Tesla's bitten off a lot, you know, just that, you know, it's kind of like bizarre to me that you like go down the, I go in my car and I look at the supercharger map and it just ends. Yeah. You know, in Southern Mexico, right. somewhere around Chiapas, for those who know mm -hmm. Mexico, mm -hmm. and there's no superchargers in Panama or Costa Rica or Honduras or Nicaragua or Venezuela, or, you know, all the way down mm -hmm. Chile, Peru, Brazil, like mm -hmm. they got a lot of superchargers left to build. Right. So I think the rest of the world, like after, um, you know, the major Asian markets, European markets uh, and North America, right? I think the rest of the world, like 10%, right? Uh, like of the, of the total vehicles, like if you have like 75, 80 million vehicles, seven, 8 million are going to the rest of the world, right? So, um, so then, as you said, the, the markets aren't much developed for anything. Right for, for for new vehicles, right? Maybe they get a lot of used vehicles or something like that. So that that's the question of like, um, yeah, can can you sell you know four million of those uh, new vehicles into these other markets? It, it still seems to be like it's going. The vehicles are going to be eighty percent going to uh, Europe, China, and North, uh, North America. And well, how if, that if they go to if FSD crosses the threshold. And now these vehicles are five times as useful. It's not that you're selling. I mean, I the way I picture the future of this next generation vehicle and really Model Y as well is once you cross that threshold to where it can operate as a robo taxi, you're not selling them to people anymore. I mean, you might still sell them to people, but you're selling them to fleet fleet operators. Mm -hmm. Now I'm operating my fleet in Sao Paulo, Brazil, mm -hmm. right? And the vehicle's operating 16 hours a day, given rides. And the price sensitivity changes when you're buying it as a fleet vehicle and it's operating that many that many hours a day. It's mm -hmm. no longer the consumer who says, I can't afford to buy more than spend more than ten thousand dollars a car. And now it's a fleet operator saying, Hey, that guy will pay, you know, 30 cents a mile for a ride, and I can make this much money if I get this vehicle. So and, and I have it, I have I have a different view on that. So yeah. I think that um it's like you're right now we you know before. Airbnb, you have hotel operators and motel operators, and you have residential thing, and you have people renting out houses and, and property and stuff like that. But then the Airbnb market came, and people could rent out rooms, and there was an expansion of people being able to offer, you know, hotel level stuff, right? And just like Uber took, you know, came in, there's taxi and, and regular cars, and then there was a mix, and there was the Uber in between, where basically people would offer their vehicles up into the network, right? Right. And I think that the robo taxi thing, that um, um, fleet operate um, <clears throat> owners operated fleet operation area will be bigger, I think, than the pure robo taxi market. One just because of the whole distribution thing that you know dedicated. You Wait, know, let me, let me just clarify what, what I think you mean. Mm -hmm. People, like, I'm going to buy a next generation vehicle for myself. Yeah. And when I'm not driving it, I'm going to put it in the fleet. Right. 
rather than the dominant story being fleet operators buying hundreds or thousands of them, it's going to be individuals are buying one mm -hmm. and then paying for it by running it as a robo taxi. And in fact, there might even be creative finance because they kind of do this with like leasing for Uber now. You come right. up with this creative financing program where you lease it for this much money and you end up making it back by being an Uber driver. Now you make it back without even having to be the driver. Right. So that's, right. okay, I can see that theory. I get my car and, you know, Americans will say, oh, I don't want somebody else messing up my car. You know, people in Latin America and poorer countries might be less hesitant to let other people ride in their car if they're, you know, as long as you have reasonable protections. But I want, sorry, I wanted to ask you this. I was kind of heading this way and I, I sidetracked myself. Mm -hmm. We know Giga Mexico is coming. Where do you see other next generation vehicle factories being built and when? So I think it should be in China because China and Europe, you know, definitely have the stronger demand for the cheap cars. We see that with the BYDs and, and, the, and like there's these super cheap 15K cars in China. So, you know, there's that ho whole other you know, clearly the volume is there. It's a significant volume in Europe, but um, probably like half of the the market uh, that that China has for for cheap vehicles, maybe a third, because Ch China sells you know twenty four or twenty five million vehicles, uh, Europe sells twelve million vehicles, and then the the price distribution of those vehicles is skewed toward the the cheaper end. You know, especially, especially compared to North America, but even for their own markets, China skews cheaper, in, in Europe, whatever. So the Demand for those vehicles as they currently exist is definitely mostly in China, Asia, and then there is a, a will be demand for for Europe. Um, so, can you get it just from expanding Berlin to also make a line or something like that? Um, but then the other thing is that if I have to put a factory someplace and then move those vehicles out on boats primarily, right? Then the issue is logistics, and that right. I'm not as, as clear on because. If right now oh, we have not enough ships to move, you know, the the whatever fifty thousand, hundred thousand cars out of out of China, and then, you know, if Shanghai's port is a bottleneck, then you can't put your 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 small factory into Shanghai if the port's a problem. But I don't have visibility into what the port situation is. But I think that the ports and the rail and other stuff like that would be key. Of like, how am I well, going to move? Maybe another city in China that has a big port. Right. Yeah. There's, and all, all, they're all on the all on the seaboard there. So just which one? I don't. I don't know which one. Well, I mean, you could sense. do inland in Chongqing, but then you wouldn't be. It would be much harder to export those vehicles. Right. Right. That doesn't make sense. It has to be on the coast someplace. Right. But which of the ports have the capacity? They're negotiating stuff, and also they're negotiating um, various subsidies. Where the Chinese government saying, "I'll give you five billion dollars to stick it here," or "I'm going to give you subsidies that end up being five billion dollars over five years or whatever." So there's issues around. Um, how much um, you know government support I'm getting to put at some location? How much government support I'm to get the workers and do whatever, right? So, but I think that the dominant thing is if it's going to be an export hub, Mexico is an export hub for this part of the world. China is going to be an export hub for the other half because I'm going to be moving in a million, two million vehicles into China, and then two million go out, right? Then, how do I move those two million vehicles out? I need to have like, um, I'm going to need to have like. Uh, four times the sh the boats, you know, that I have that currently moving vehicles out of uh, Shanghai now, right? So I, I don't know how they, how they, that's, I think, the main problem. You know, it's that. also interesting. They chose Nuevo Leon, uh, Mexico, which is not coastal. Mm -hmm. Like, how are they getting these vehicles to a port? Um, the, the, it's closer to the, to the Gulf of Mexico than it is to the Pacific. So if you're going to build these vehicles, I mean, maybe they're just building for the Mexican market, which is the biggest, I think it's the biggest market in Latin America. But if they want to ship these vehicles to Brazil or Chile or Argentina, um, Colombia, Peru, I don't think they're going to train them. I don't know if there's what? a good, is there a good train? Do we know if there's a good train line? down through Mexico to the Latin America? So they may, may, maybe make dedicated highways and stuff. Like I probably like a couple hundred miles to get someplace, a hundred miles. I don't know. So I think a hundred miles is, is, it's not like that far inland, right? So it is something where they have to move it, but maybe they decide that's not that big an issue. Um, 
but you know, to me, it's, it's like moving the cars is, as we've seen, is, is a problem. Oh, I've got, I'm great. I just figured out a solution. Okay. A boring company tunnel. Okay. From Monterey down through Latin America into South America, down through Central America, that, that would solve the problem. So right. I, I, I'm going to call Elon after we're done with this, with a zoom and tell him he's got to build a, a boring company tunnel system down mm -hmm. through Latin America. That'll, that'll solve Giga Mexico's problem. So you think somewhere in China, other than Shanghai might make more sense. I'm a little, unless, I'm unless a little they solve the Shanghai port problem. What's that? Unless they solve the Shanghai port problem. Maybe the Shanghai port isn't that much of a problem. Okay. Cause Shanghai, that port is such high volume that Tesla is probably yeah. only a small part of that. Yeah. Then do they build in Austin? Do they, will there be a next generation vehicle factory in the United States? Where would they build that? I mean, I feel like the Southeastern United States would make sense, you know, Tennessee or Georgia or something like that, but maybe it's easier to just build in Texas. I don't know. It doesn't seem like shipping costs from Texas to the rest of the country are that high. And if they're, improving the efficiency of making the vehicles maybe the labor demand won't be that big of a challenge you know because they're using this unboxed process and the mm -hmm. castings maybe the labor content of the vehicles is smaller as they grow i mean if I you get, yeah if you get to four million vehicles out of uh, the mexico factory right then you know your initial demand you, how you have to be super confident of all the orders to say i'm going to you know, stack up two more factories, get to capacity of like, you know, six to 10 million vehicles. Wait, wait. Um, you think they're yeah. going to do 4 million out of Giga Mexico? I okay, well, two. okay. I, I think that I'm thinking that they can get to get to four, but you know, so let's say, let's say two, then fine, whatever. If still they have to have comp, even if let's, let's say it's two, two more factories get to 6 million capacity, right? Then, you know, then it's the issue of like, uh, don't you know they seem to have the, the track record of like i want to see this thing get fully running built up and then you know learn something from it and then build the next two like well but they, uh, they built berlin and texas at the same time right they did yeah and that's why i think they've demonstrated we can build two factories at the same time now let's blow everybody away and build four at the same time mm -hmm. and i i mean i see i was a little surprised by mexico but okay i can it makes sense mm -hmm. i see Somewhere in China, maybe Shanghai, somewhere in the United States, maybe it's Austin, maybe it's Tennessee, Georgia, something like that. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in Europe, maybe it's, I feel like on the continent makes more, people saying Ireland, but I think on the continent makes more sense than Ireland, just because from Ireland, you got to ship everything over the water to get it to the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. And then I still think we're going to see a Giga Osaka, a, a Tesla factory in Japan. What do you think about the prospects for a next generation vehicle factory in Japan? Um, you know, the Japanese market, you know, is big enough to have its own factory, but I'm think there's something political there where the Japanese are not uh, friendly to getting, letting Tesla in, you know, cause they, you know, a lot of their economies that, you know, it'd be putting a world of hurt onto Toyota and Honda and that kind of stuff. So I think the gov Japanese government is going to block them out as long as they can. Um, they'd have to, you know, start losing everything else and, and be some kind of like, okay, we're going to be cut out entirely because our guys aren't going to be able to and Honda can't, can't make it. And so now we have to let them in because we're going to lose it anyway. Let's lose it and have our jobs saved kind of thing. So I think that's the kind of calculus that Japan might be going through. Right. I would talk to somebody, I'm not saying it was reliable. And he said that those decisions are more regional than national. Mm -hmm. Panasonic is a big supplier to Tesla. Yeah. Panasonic is dominant in Osaka. Mm -hmm. Toyota is dominant in like, I think Nagoya mm -hmm. and Mazda, for example, is in Hiroshima. I forget where, where, where Honda's based. So mm -hmm. if, if Panasonic wants Tesla in, in Osaka, they may be able to make that call. And I just like, like the Japanese, Japan had like 4 million vehicles sold last year. So Tesla built a factory that was able to produce 2 million vehicles for the Japanese market. They would own half the Japanese car market. Right. I could see that being disruptive, but you know, it would take a few years to get there. And I think the cold hard reality is as Tesla grows in the United States and the rest of the world, Toyota and Honda are losing sales anyway. Right. 
at some point it becomes, well, these companies aren't viable anymore. Right. And I, I don't know, you know, Japan does not have a history of reacting well to that kind of change. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be pretty obvious pretty quickly that Toyota and Honda and Mitsubishi makes cars and Mazda mm -hmm. makes cars. They're they're just done. And right. Japan does want to shift to sustainable energy because they don't like having to depend on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And Tesla is the only one who's really offering to deliver something that gets them off fossil fuels. I, I mean, and, and the thing is, like, nobody thought they could get into China. Mm -hmm. Not only did they get into China, they got into China with a Tesla owned factory. They didn't have to do a, a joint venture with anybody. Mm -hmm. So, and I was actually thinking, so Tesla had or has still Hiromichi Mizuno on the board of Tesla. Mm -hmm. and I thought maybe they hired Hiromichi Mizuno as a way of getting, you know, using his influence to get into Japan. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's off the board because he wasn't able to pull those levers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I'm actually kind of wondering is the fact that, um, for, sorry, for people who don't know, Tesla has a board of directors. Um, there, there's an election coming up at the next shareholder meeting. Uh, I've already voted. You know, if you if you got your proxies, you you probably already voted. Um, they're adding J.B. Straubel, who was the former chief technology for office, officer for Tesla and this current CEO of Redwood Materials, which probably is partnering with Tesla and on battery recycling. Um, but in order to make space for J.B. Straubel, Hiromichi Mizuno is stepping down from the Tesla board, and maybe that's a signal that Giga Japan isn't going to happen. That he, you know, I I felt like that was one of my theories about why he was on the board right was because he's making this happen so maybe giga japan isn't going to happen anytime soon so i think 20 late 2024 2025 is when you know if tesla's that you know you know five million vehicles and then you know wrapping up mexico and getting to seven eight million vehicles in um 2025 right then the writing will be on the wall for you know because they will they'll you know, cut um, you know, twenty three percent out of out of Toyota, you know, even more out of out of Honda, and and that would be you know around that point, twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five, as Tesla as keeps on those things, then Japan realizes, oh crap, it, it's over, you know, we've lost, we have to save these jobs as opposed to save the company, you know, so they'll the, the, then they'll uh, throw in the towel on that. So well, yeah, Elon same, comes. I could just see Elon, see Elon coming into Japan saying, look. We want to build with, we want Panasonic to build us a lithium iron phosphate or lithium manganese iron phosphate uh, battery cells because they're already building a 4680 factory in, in Wakayama, Japan, Panasonic. Where are those batteries going to go? I could see Tesla, you know, Elon going over to Japan and saying, look, we're going to create jobs building batteries for you with Panasonic. We're going to create jobs building cars for you. We're going to supply your public with better cars than what you have now that are more efficient and get you off oil. It seems like the sales pitch is there. And my gut hunch is, again, Hiromichi Mizuno was making that pitch. Mm -hmm. And it must have, and, and my theory is it failed. Now, maybe the th maybe what actually happened is they achieved it. It hasn't been public yet. And they've already decided to build a factory in Japan and he achieved his mission. And now they don't need him on the board anymore. That's another theory, but I think that's overly optimistic. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you're trying to transition the world to sustainable energy and you can't make a dent in the third largest car market in the world, because Tesla's uh, Tesla's got you know almost no sales in Japan, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, Japan's also like the second largest market for large trucks. So the largest market is um, China, at you know 1.5 million large trucks. You mean like semi? Uh, Semi, yeah, semi and large trucks. Yeah, they have a different kind of category for that thing, but they call them large trucks. So semi type vehicles, uh, but variant for the Asian market. So um, Japan has, has has double the U.S. sales for those vehicles, and so that's something where as the semi gets traction, twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five, then um, that that could justify its own dedicated, you know, double large um, versus the U.S. Uh, truck um, system. And then that would be a far more impactful on um, the oil import issue that Japan has. So I think they let them in there. It's only 
taking out Suzuki trucks and whatever other trucks that they have there. And they say, okay, you know, you're five, eight years ahead of everyone else on the trucks. We'll let you in on that first. And then they get the other stuff. And also around, so I think around 2024, 2025 would be expected. Probably my money would be on 2025. That Japan realizes that we have to let Tesla in in a big way and then flip over and then let that all happen. Um, but, you know, you could be right. Maybe Osaka regional issues and they can get something in earlier. Okay. So when, when I was mapping out Tesla's future um, over the next several years, I recently did some numbers and I, I kind of wonder, are they going to accelerate fast on the next generation vehicle platform and, you know, build up like four factories quickly? You know, if, he, if they build up four factories, let's say in the next two years, and then those factories ramp to 2 million vehicles a piece, that's 8 million vehicles a year, plus, you know, the current, you know, 2 million plus, and you're over 10 million within like four or five years, that's a really good sign for Tesla's rapid progress. Um, I had another model where they take longer to get everything going. And the next few years, growth is relatively flat, you know, 30% a year instead of, but if, if we see like four factories going up fast, then unit deliveries go up like really, really fast. Not necessarily revenue because the vehicles cost less, but that's another way of looking at it. So you think we're going to see a more rapid rollout of next generation vehicle factories, or you think it's going to be slow? So um, it depends upon um, Tesla going um, next level. Like the operational efficiency execution thing is only, you know, 20, 30% here or there each year kind of thing. It's, it's not that big, but if they get to the unbox process, if they get Tesla bots working in the factories, if they get FSD going, like, so those game changers and the timing of those things is which what um, Elon says, so tough, so tough to predict exponentials, right? That when I, I go an inflection point on my exponential, right? It's going to be based on, do I have the real deal FSD? Do I have a uh, unbox process fully worked and how, how well is that working? Do I have Tesla bot in the factory? And, and if I've, Execute on all those pieces if they've come together, just like um, you know everything came together on Model Three, Model Y, you know the next level from from S from Model S, right? That when they go to these phase changes of the company, yeah, that's that's going to determine. It's it's more prediction about that than about do I make do I spend eight billion dollars on capital to build to start four factories, each costing $2 million to start off with, and then, you know, putting more money into it. So not less the capital spend versus have I gone next level? Have I, you know, you know, in the Japanese anime, Super Saiyan 4 or something like that. <laughs> it's uh, from Dragon Ball Z. I just want know. to mention when they did the model three, there was this production hell. Mm -hmm. At investor day, they made this presentation where they basically showed that they do a simulation of the factory that I don't think they had when they did model three. No. So I think they have a much better idea of how they're going to build their next generation factories and how they're going to ramp them because they have these really sophisticated simulations of this is what the factory is going to be like. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's, they're much more likely to be able to get their factory going and ramp it quickly because of their quality of their simulation software which is kind of amazing. Um, I wanted to turn, if I can, mm -hmm. um, we're going to get to FSD beta in a few minutes, but I wanted to talk about Semi and Cybertruck. You kind of dropped a little bit on Semi there. I didn't realize mm -hmm. Japan's market for Semi was bigger than the US. I think the trucks in Japan are smaller than Semi, but that's all. that could be the Semi light that they mentioned in the master plan because they probably don't have to go as far in Japan as they do in the US. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with Cybertruck. I have two Cybertrucks on order, one <laughs> an early order, one a later order. You have a Cybertruck on order? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, 21. So 21 of them. Seems like we're going to start seeing the beginnings of production soon. Mm -hmm. Like June or July. And that would suggest we're going to start seeing vehicles delivered before the end of the year. Does that is that your rough impression? Yes. Yeah, that made my rough impression. And you said something to me before we started about semi and Cybertruck both, which kind of took me back, mm -hmm. you know, as bullish as I am. 
you said you think Cybertruck is going to take 80% of the pickup market and semi is going to take 80% of the semi market. And that's once they scale, they, they have to scale manufacturing to the point they can make that many. Mm -hmm. Can you explain your, let's start with Cybertruck. How does Cybertruck take 80% of the pickup market? So one, um, uh, pickup truck market, mainly uh, North America, right? So Tesla currently has 60 some percent of the EV market in um, in North America. So if they only do as well as Model 3 and Model Y, right, then in North America, then they get 67% of the market, right? Two is that um, I think it's more technologically challenging to make a heavy Cybertruck and also even tougher to make a uh, semi-truck. And the I'm looking at the competitors, you know, Ford Lightning, Rivian, trying to scale to, you know, 50,000 a year, maybe next year, 100,000 a year and that kind of stuff. So, you know, Tesla is starting later so to catch up, but, you know, Tesla being able to make 5,000 a million would mean that, you know, for Rivian and Ford to get to, you know, um, one third of the market, you know, if it's $1.5 million, $1.5 million market, Tesla making one million, they have to make five hundred thousand, and that I think is challenging for them to do, right? Because I think I for, think the pickup market in the United States is closer to three million. Right, right. So then, if you go to three million, then Tesla's making two million, and they're making one. So they have to make their one, right? And I don't, I'm, I have difficulty seeing them combined getting to one million of those vehicles. Um, that yeah, let one... me just let me just address this really quick because I've I've been following Rivian, and there was there was mm -hmm. a recent tweet thread. I guess the CFO of Rivian was talking about what their plans are. Mm -hmm. And I think second half of, I think 2024 Rivian is shooting for something like 80. I don't know if it was the second half of 2024 or just this is a total volume for 24. They were shooting for something like 85,000 of the R1 platform, which is the current vehicles that they sell with a positive gross profit, which is a stretch because they're losing so much money per car right now. Mm -hmm. But okay. But that's still like a drop compared to the 3 million truck market. And the Rivian R1T is kind of a niche vehicle. Mm -hmm. The bed isn't the bed just isn't big enough for a typical pickup truck. Mm -hmm. And then they're working on their next generation platform, which is probably going to be smaller than mm -hmm. the R1 platform. Mm -hmm. So I just don't see Rivian. I think I'm hopeful. I, I don't own any stock in Rivian. I just for some reason, believe in the company, and I may be wrong about that. I think they are actually going to survive, but they're just going to be a niche player. Mm -hmm. Ford, and, and actually a, a key distinction between Cybertruck and the Ford and Rivian products, Ford F-150 Lightning and the Rivian both weigh about 7,000 pounds. I predict, and I'm often wrong, I predict Cybertruck is going to come in around 5,000 pounds. And that roughly corresponds to your cost of manufacturing. Not to mention that Cybertruck's gonna have a lot of other manufacturing advantages, but if your vehicle weighs five sevenths of the weight of these other vehicles, then the cost of raw materials is probably roughly five sevenths of the other company's cars, plus Tesla doesn't have to paint the Cybertruck. Mm -hmm. So with F-150 Lightning, I think it's 7,100 pounds or something like that, or 6,900 pounds. It's not, and the range is terrible. And I think there's some Dodge product or Chevy product, and they're using these large battery packs. Um, I think Tesla's going to, the first generation Cybertruck, I, I believe long run Tesla has to have a 170 kilowatt hour pack to get to 500 miles of range with Cybertruck. I think the first generation Cybertruck is going to have like 140 kilowatt hour pack and 420 miles of range. And they'll say, Hey, this is what we can do for now. We're going to be hitting 500 miles later. That's still better than any other truck mm -hmm. by far. And with much more miles per kilowatt hour, like Ford and the other companies, they can, they can't, they can maybe get to two miles a kilowatt hour. Tesla's probably going to get to three mm -hmm. cyber truck, lower mass, better coefficient of drag, you know, a variety of reasons why a more efficient powertrain. I don't see, like I'm kind of going towards your point. It's like, well, Tesla's going to make in very large volumes and the other companies just won't be, have competitive products. Right. Yeah, they want competitive products. And then also 
even if they did have some kind of competitive product, they have to make them at scale, which they have not been shown to do. Like um, Ford's talking about getting to, what was it? Um, one or 2 million vehicles total, uh, all EVs by, um, what, 2026? So if, if they hit their targets, right? right? And so how many of those are the Ford Lightning versus the um, the Mach-E's and, and whatever else they're going to make? And then the Lightning has terrible towing capability. It drops down yeah. to 100 miles or less if you're putting any kind of weight into that vehicle. So It is popular, though. Let's be clear. The F-150 Lightning seems to be popular. I've seen it. I like it. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm critical of Ford, but mm -hmm. I'll say I've seen the F-150 Lightning in person. I thought mm -hmm. it looked pretty cool. Yeah, It looks like an F-150, to be fair, but it they did some nice finishing touches. I believe Ford announced they're going to come up with a completely new pickup. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm sure they would. And that, you know, oh. they, they figured it out now. Okay, this this was our first hack. This really isn't going to cut it. Right. We've got to really go all in and come up with a completely different pickup. Right. So it, 25 to 30% of the market in the United States is for real work truck vehicles. So ones that are, you know, some housing contractor or um, some builder who needs to load that truck up with stuff. And I think that the semi-tech, you know, three three motor uh, design, 1000 volt powertrain stuff in the Cybertruck will let it tow, you know, with minimal degradation on, on range, you know, 10,000 pounds and those kind of things. So- And the carry 3,500 pounds of payload in the vehicle as well. Right. And so it will be so outclassed, the vehicles that no work truck person, even though I don't like it, but it's like, I can't move my crap. Right. Then I, they have to go for that. So then they dominate that one at, you know, 90 plus percent. Right. And then if the other guy, they're taking 200 kilowatt hours or 220 kilowatt hours to do a, a battery pack to do what Tesla does with 150, 160. Right. Then the 60 kilowatt hour of the pack, that's like 10, 15 grand of, of batteries and stuff like that. So it's, you know, again, it's like uh, it, to get to something that's, remotely competitive on, on price and on performance for those vehicles is very difficult. So can you make them good enough? Can you get remotely competitive on price? And can you um, make them in high volume? And do you have the batteries and, and factories to do it? And again, if I'm going to make 2 million um, cyber trucks, that's, um, you know, at the 100 kilowatt hour pack average sizes, that's what... Uh, um, 200 gigawatt hours of batteries. Let me get that right. Um, 2 million. I think that Cybertruck is going to have a 140 kilowatt hour pack. I mean, I suppose right. the, the, in the, for the work truck market you're talking about, it's got to have a bigger pack. Right. Where the, this, if, if they're ever going to do the single motor Cybertruck, which I don't think they'll ever get to. Yeah. Um, that would probably get by with a hundred kilowatt hour pack. Right. Um, I think the dual motor has to have more than hundred. If they can get three miles a kilowatt hour, they said 300 miles of range then a hundred kilowatt hour pack would be sufficient for the dual motor cyber truck. So that could be why they said a hundred kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. The dual motor cyber truck with 300 miles of range, mm -hmm. if you don't need to tow, mm -hmm. right? Cause if you need to tow any distance, then 300 miles of range isn't going to be sufficient. Mm -hmm. But if you could get 300 miles of range out of a hundred kilowatt hour pack, then yeah, if that's the, if that's the volume, 2 million vehicles, yeah, you're talking about Two, what was it? Two million times? Yeah, that's that's two hundred gigawatt hours. Yeah, and then the other guy that they're using more batteries to do it, and the one million vehicles, you know, they have to get to one hundred fifty gigawatt hours. You know, so if if Rivian hits their eighty k, right, they still have to five x their company to get to four hundred k, right, in order to, to do that. And it's like, how long does it take to take Tesla to to five x? You know, from you know eighty k up to you know four hundred five hundred k, right? So it's the uh, you know, and that the and Tesla would be price competitive because it'd be kind of priced in order to move more cyber trucks and stuff like that. So it would be a tough market for these other guys to, to be in. Um and yeah, so I think there's three or four things that be like, how can they get to really, really huge numbers and in any kind of time frame, right? So that's where I see, you know, the you know, if they're saying they only get 20% or 30% of the market, how are these other guys gonna that means someone else is bigger than Tesla, right? In, in these things, like how are they getting bigger? How, how are their vehicles getting better? And how are they going to make that many things? And even, I don't see anything in the plans for factories, for batteries and stuff like that to, to get. And that's even more true in the semi-market. 
Yeah, but I was going to ask you about that. So with the semi market, it seems like Tesla semi is light years better than any other EV and dramatically less costly to run than a diesel semi. Right. And I think they're going to, they're rebuilt. I don't think there's been any construction started yet, but Giga Nevada is going to expand. So we figure it's sometime in 2024 that they've completed the expansion of Giga Nevada and they start building 4680 cells there and they start building semi there. They probably don't deliver a significant volume of semis until 2025. But I think, well, they, I think they said I think they said Giga Nevada would be fifty thousand semis a year. In twenty twenty four, they said they said they would have fifty thousand vehicles and twenty uh, semis in twenty twenty four. I don't see they them getting that. to fifty thousand in twenty twenty. I don't see how they do that. They mm -hmm. haven't even started building the factory yet. But you know what's the what's the volume of that factory in Giga Nevada? Where where do they produce semi in sufficient volume? Because the U.S. market is and the North American market is like two hundred fifty thousand semis a year. Mm -hmm. China's market is bigger. Japan's market is bigger. I think they have to build semis in China. Mm -hmm. And they need to build a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think it's that semi light is going to be dominant in the rest of the world. It's only the US that's going to have semi heavy. Mm -hmm. But you think they can still achieve? Because I, I don't want to underestimate the potential for Chinese companies to innovate. I mm -hmm. think that, you know, the companies that make trucks in China will probably be able to innovate sufficiently that with China being such a big part of the global market for semi, I got to think that they're going to come up with something that's close. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just too hard to innovate in the way the Tesla innovated with semi. So um, Daimler truck, which owns Freightliner. So they make about 550,000 to 500 some thousand uh, trucks um, a year, right? So they're the biggest, right? Um, China has a, a, some of the players, uh, some quite big, but not, I think, quite as big as, as that. Um, and uh, so Freightliner is their U.S. maker, and then Daimler is their one in Europe. And so they make about like 180,000 um, some vehicles, 200,000 some vehicles in the United States, and then 180,000 whatever in 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 Europe and the other thing. And they're a $60 billion revenue company, right? So they make all those trucks and they're, you know, selling them for, you know, a, a smaller amount, right? 120,000, 150,000 average price because they're, um, the, the diesel trucks are cheaper. But the the cheapness is that um, they cost, you know, four times as much to operate, you know, if you're driving it for large amounts versus, so, Especially at um, you know five dollar a gallon diesel, Tesla's equivalent thing is like a buck seventy diesel. You know in terms of the, the price of it, so you recover your costs. You know within two two years, depending upon the price of, of the vehicle um, for the EV. Um, so they have about a billion dollars, uh, one point seven billion dollars of R and D. They're spreading it out among um, their getting fuel efficiency and emission and CO2 things that they have to do for, for Europe may be a mandate. So they're spending a bunch of money on that and they're spending very little on the uh, electric cars. And they still have hydrogen trucks in their plant, right? So I looked at their annual report from last year and they're going to roll out hydrogen vehicles in 2025. So all the money they're spending on this stuff. So the five years of research they took to make the eCascadia truck, which has 150 mile and 220 mile range and they're making a few hundred a, a year right because right? it's useless right and but you know they're, they're they all the guys in like 2022 before the Tesla um semi came out they're talking about well what you know still an adoption problem we don't have the charging stuff we don't have um the um uh, the 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 sticker shock at the 300,000 500,000 cost for each of these things so the the guys aren't buying it they they don't know if it's going to have the maintenance issues and other stuff. So there's all these reasons why they didn't want to do it. And they're saying, well, we'll make enough based on the government mandate. And the government, like uh, um, California says, we're going to put $10 billion into buying um, EV trucks and other things over the next six years. So like a billion and a half, so basically enough for like a few thousand, maybe 5,000 a year, 
right? And then other places may also be doing these giveaways. So they're sizing their production to, we're going to get a piece of these massively subsidized trucks, right? Where you're giving me 250K, 300K, which is what you know, New York and California are doing to make these, these vehicles. If you're not subsidized, no one's buying it, right? And they're not going in high volume. The most is saying, oh, maybe we'll make 2,000, 3,000 a year, right? That's their idea of mass production. So if Tesla does go to 50,000, then no one has a factory. No one has the competitive trucks. Um, Mercedes-Benz is going to make the e Octurus. I don't even know how to pr pronounce it, but they're making a new long haul truck, which will have 500 kilometers of range, 300 miles, starting in serial production in 2024, if they hit their target. So serial production means they're making like 10 a month, you know, 20 a month hand built, which is the level that Tesla's at now with the semi before they go to real mass production, right? Yeah. So the vehicle and the technology is not there yet, some years behind, and then they have to prove this all out. And they they don't have mega packs. Tesla can make 10,000 mega packs and then 20,000 mega packs. And then you need that for the mega charging network, right? So you're only competing on the, what they call the dryage, moving stuff between ports, the short haul, you know, like uh, use case. That's where you're doing it. That's where the, the, the governments have funded it. So if Tesla goes to um, the only one who can do regional trucks, right, then it, the market's to themselves and they have the better pricing versus the diesel vehicles. Also, Tesla's going to end up having lower costs of goods sold. Tesla's cost, of, if, if Tesla's building at scale and no one else is. Right then Tesla's going to have lower manufacturing costs. Not to mention right. Tesla's probably going to have, you know, a lot of other efficiencies. Right. So. And they have all the parts that they share in common with all the other vehicles, the same motors as the, as the Plaid, same motors as the Cybertruck, same, you know, Battery other, sy uh, other systems. Right. So they have everything else in volume and no one else does. And, and then the biggest competitor is about a $60 billion company. You know, that's got the, the most of, you know, significant part of Europe, you know, 30% of Europe, 40% of, of the United States, and they got $60 million and they, you know, would be struggle. They'd have to like, up, a government has to give me $10 billion, $5 billion so I can make a, a factory a comparable size to what Tesla is doing in Nevada. Tesla is going to do that for $3.9 billion at the, at the initial deposit on what they're going to make there. And then they make the batteries and, and, the, and, the, and the semi truck stuff. So the, Tesla is already deploying about $10 billion of Nevada factory. Nevada factory expansion, um, Lathrop factory, R&D, and then all this other stuff that they're sharing with other things. And the other guys, like their whole company is $60 billion and they need to keep the other stuff going. So how can they, they have to get a government savior to come in. to so like, here, we're going to Airbus you. You need to catch up. We need to, to do something, right? If they don't come in with an Airbus-like thing to like make you competitive with Tesla, then they're not going to be competitive with Tesla. So I'm just going back on this a little bit. It seems to me like what you're saying is Cybertruck will ultimately sell if the global, if the U.S. market for cyber for pickup trucks is three million vehicles, and Tesla is going to capture eighty percent, even if it's less than that. Tesla might sell two million Cybertrucks a year, and then for semi, Tesla might sell a million semis a year. So in their um, master plan, they said 2 million long haul um, uh, semi trucks, uh, 1 million short haul. So they said 3 million per year. So if they had 80% of that, it would be 2 million. Right. 80% of that would be 2.4 million. Yeah, yeah, 2.4 million eventually. Yeah. And it's not going to be 2030 unless they get, you know, robo ta uh, the Tesla bot and other things happening. It's going to be like 2035, maybe 2038. But things increasing the scale fact. of manufacturing to get to the point where they can make this many. I mean, this is I, this is my take on Tesla all the time. Is I don't think Tesla's demand limited as much as they are manufacturing limited and engineering limited mm -hmm. to be able to get these things together and get them produced in higher volumes. All right, let's turn to FSD and FSD beta. Mm -hmm. So I have FSD. I, I downloaded last night or installed last night the latest version of FSD beta, version 11.3.6. I've been driving version 11.3 for a few weeks now, all the earlier versions of 11.3. Um, I have this particular intersection where my car, it's, it's, you make a sharp right turn to head to a traffic light, and then the car is supposed to make a left turn at the traffic light. And on version 10.69, the previous class of, of FSD, it would almost always 
probably 90, 90% of the time it would bail out and turn right instead of turning left. And I would have to intervene and stop it. On 11.3, the earlier versions of 11.3, I was doing better than 50% getting it right, at least making the turn. There's some issues after it makes the turn, but at least it makes the turn. And I think it may have, I still see there's this thing, if you're familiar with FSD, there's this thing in the car display that shows a, a blue line or blue, we call it the blue tether that indicates which direction the car is planning on going. And it does still flicker to the right, but it comes back and goes left. And it's so far been pretty consistent on 11. It's much more consistent on 11.3 going left. It still has issues, but that's an improvement on the, on the drive home. Sorry, I, I go to the gym and normally I walk to the gym, but because I had 11.3.6, I had to drive to the gym today, let FSB be to get me there. And I can, there's a free charger nearby. On the way back, this is for those who are familiar with uh, Cape Canaveral. This is Astronaut Boulevard um, coming northbound on Astronaut Boulevard. There's a flashing yellow light just past City Hall right before my turn onto uh, to Atlantic Boulevard. And the car has, on previous versions, including 11.3.3, the car would slow for the flashing yellow, which it shouldn't. And this morning it didn't slow for the flashing yellow. So I, I keep seeing significant improvements. There's still issues with like getting into that left turn lane to make that left turn lane choices. There's still issues, but I feel like I've seen for me, very significant progress. And I think they're still working. There's still some, like Elon said, they're still converting some legacy parts of the software to going on video rather than going on still images and once you get everything over to where you want to go then you've got to do a lot more data and a lot more training and they're generating a lot more data uh, arc invest just pointed out that tesla is now getting a ridiculously much larger volume of data because of the shift to fsd version 11 getting data from highway instead of from um not just city streets um dojo is probably online or coming online soon we're going to get more processing power I think we're going to, I just, my take is we're going to see FSD get radically better by the end of this year. Is it going to cross the line into, you know, genuine full self-driving? You don't have to sit in the driver's seat anymore. Or I think we're going to get to the point where you don't have to, it stops nagging you. Like mm -hmm. I, I have this theory that there's two steps. Step one is you don't have to pay attention anymore, but you have to sit in the front seat in the driver's seat. So in case we, we, you knew we need you to take over. You're there. And the next level is you don't even have to sit in the front seat. I think we're going to get to you. You don't have to pay attention anymore. The nags are gone. You have to sit there, but the nags are gone by the end of this year. And we're going to get to, you can sit in the back seat next year. That's just my, I, I tend to be very optimistic about it. What are you seeing with FSD, FSD beta and the, the future the next couple of years and beyond? So, um, in terms of the plateau of, of where it gets to, that is unclear, but the, they said that they were using generative AI for the language of lanes, right? And the fact that generative AI, the chat GPT type stuff is, is just taken off like crazy, right? That that indicates that, that they are leveraging that, those kinds of AI capabilities as well. And so that would, you know, we're seeing the, um, more visibly seeing the improvement of the chat GPT like systems. And we're expecting that to get like 10 X better by the end of the year, you know, with GPT five. Right. So Tesla will also have the same thing. Right. And then how much, if everything's converted over to, you know, neural nets, which is, you know, the general AI type stuff, then they're on the same progress curve as that. Right. So that gives me confidence that, um, you know, and they have the data. So the data, they have the the the, the right software with neural nets, and they have um, all the processing power, all all the money spent on that. So I think that they get to full robotaxi level. You know, as you say, in Q four, Q one. And if I, if we're over optimistic, then Q three next year is plenty fine. But the issue then would be that if they get to what you're talking about, super comfortable, where you know, everyone's fully confident in it, all the you know. Um, um, nervous drivers who oh, I, I don't feel comfortable with it, they also feel good. So, so the people who are confident with it feel really great about it, and the people who are 
not, not as confident, feel good about it. You give the two month free trial to people and then you get the, the, the three, five X adoption. And if you solve the roads in China and other places, which they're coming to there, then, and they solve the issue of like, they're concerned about them spying on whatever the military stuff is, then the adoption rate can go up to 40, 50%, especially if you bundle it with insurance. So the highly confident thing that you're talking about means that if you bump the adoption rate to 50%, right, then, you know, that's a huge game changer. Because then I, I got $15,000 worth of um, of uh, additional sales, or I got $200 a month, every month going forward or whatever. You know, they have this extra level of margin for the vehicles to to get to lower prices and, and to, to sell more vehicles, right? So, you know, and then the the quarter it hits of like when did it hit quarter wise for robo taxi is some of that if we're saying Q1 to Q4 next year good enough right because then you still have to make all the robo taxi vehicles in high volume although you can suck up the all the people who bought FFD into a Airbnb like network you know faster you can say okay flip it on if you don't have um, FFD you can buy it and by the way you can make X thousand dollars, you know, a thousand dollars per per month, your two hundred dollar cost, or, or but you'll give us half, you know, so it's five hundred, five hundred. It'd be proper for you, right, to do it. So I think it's, I think it's a lot more than a thousand dollars a month. Right, right, right. I'm just, I'm just saying that that I many thousand it, I dollars. It's, it's, it's. I think it's easily fifty thousand dollars a year in the early days. Right. So that's two thousand, four thousand dollars. You know, if you two thousand a month, and you give you give Tesla a cut. Right. You give Tesla half, you take, they take half, you take half. I think then... Tesla's going to give, I think in order to motivate people to put vehicles in the fleet, Tesla's going to give the, the owner 70%. Okay. Maybe more. Mm -hmm. It may be like, if you already bought FSD, we'll give you 80%. Mm -hmm. If you're buying FSD now, there's going to be like options. Like you can buy FSD in full for $50,000 and you get the 80%, mm -hmm. or you can buy FSD for $20,000 and you get 50%. Right. I, I think there's, there's, It'll be interesting to see how they price it, but so two step changes. Like one is you know huge adoption because people love it and feel comfortable with it. Three, I bundle it with insurance so that the half of the drivers who are who are the below average human drivers get replaced, making things safer. And then three, well, there's probably two levels of robo taxi in terms of like you know partial robo taxi, full robo taxi, whatever. And also robo truck. I think robo truck would be a, a big deal, but right. that's probably when you get them up in volume. So. Those, this four or five levels in there that are step changes in terms of the financials of it. So that, I view it in terms of that financial lens of when it changed. But again, it's like until it happens, you know, just like until Mall 3 is, is being built, it's, it hadn't happened yet. So until they get to those next levels in FSD. Um, and so it's not like level two, level three, level four, level five autonomy. It's like level two financials for, for, Tesla of like, I'm going to do the bonus, uh, free, free two months trial and get a bunch of people sign up, doubling how many people use FSD and then double again when I do the insurance bundle. Well, I, I mean, I think that if you deliver a car that can drive itself, I think even if you can deliver a car that can drive itself, but you have to sit in the driver's seat. Yeah. I think that leads to adoption of a hundred percent. And, and yeah. I would say more. Like there's going to be so much demand for that car mm -hmm. that Tesla's not going to sell it without FSD. Right. And then, you know, six months later, a year later, when you can sit in the back seat and you can run it as a robo taxi, like it would, and, and for, for shareholders, just to be clear for people who are Tesla stockholders, what that does to Tesla's profits is insane. Right. Tesla goes from like, I don't know, 15% operating margin or 18% operating margin and, you know, 20, 25% gross margin, they go to like 50% gross margin and 35% operating margin and 30% net margin. And it just means the profit like triples. Right. And then and, and, I can and possibly more than that. And that's right. just in the short term. And as you go out, it just ends up getting better and better and better. And then I can see 10 million model Ys, robo model Ys. Right now, sold. Model Y, because well, that's the point. Like when I talked about the ceiling on Model Y, all of a sudden the ceiling on all these, they're no longer just cars. Yeah. Right. People still think they're just cars. They're not, if you own one and, you know, I own two and I think you own one, like mm -hmm. 
they're not just cars. They're like, it's a computer on wheels. It's a robot. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't get it. And I, I think that that's, you know, that we're, we're still hanging on this question. When does Tesla deliver on FSD? And I do think you're correct that we're seeing AI accelerate. And Tesla is going to be a part of that acceleration with the combination mm -hmm. of Dojo, with the vo increased volume of data, with figuring out the models. I think the shift from the still images to the, the 3D video, the, the 3D video clips. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, he, Elon talks about how the neural nets are growing, and I don't think we understand that. And almost sometimes when he talks about it, it sounds like he does, he's not really sure he understands it either. Mm -hmm. There's so many neural nets running in there. There's larger neural net models. I don't claim to understand it all. All right. So I think we've covered FSD. Is there anything you wanted to say about FSD beta before we move on to Mega Factory? Um, so the FSD and the, and the Tesla bot thing. So because you're watching the chat GPT thing explode in the GPT-5 and, and what's going to happen there, I'm tracking that thing fairly closely. The size of the models go to 2 trillion parameters. There's a guy, Alan Thompson, who advises the governments and... Mm -hmm. um, and does YouTube videos and stuff like that, and also by the companies, he has this AGI tracker, which says it's right now at 48%. So his 80% thing is embodied um, um, generative AI, which he thinks is going to be, you know, um, able to solve the Steve Wadley, I think of walking into a room, picking up a cup of coffee and doing about all this stuff, right? So basically he's saying full Tesla bot. He's saying full Tesla bot within 36 months. And he's probably saying even faster, like 12 to 24 months, right? So this is a non-Tesla guy saying that humanoid bot is going to happen with this generative AI in this, his, his super pessimistic case of 36 months. He, if you listen to him talk, he's talking 12 to 24. And right? you're saying, I can, I can say to the bot, hey, go to the kitchen, get me a beer out of the fridge. Right. And that'll be done and that'll be available in less than two years. Right. Sometime late in 2024 or something like that, that'd be roughly when it could happen. Right. So I'm sorry, not a beer. Make make me a vegan smoothie. Sorry, just to be clear. Right. It's not gonna be a beer, it's gonna be a vegan smoothie. Right. I'm, I'm so, so other people are saying that, and I can go over the side of the model. We do a longer deep dive on that, right? In terms of like how many trained parameters, how that stuff explodes. So the the A before I was always looking at AI minimalist, like let, let's not count too much on FSD. I switched over to the AI maximalist position that it's, you know, the full self-driving and Tesla bot will happen because of this other AI stuff happening. That, that uh, and Tesla's riding that wave and had the people, and have been riding that wave on that. So thus, I, I believe that it puts the guarantee that RoboTaxi 2025, whatever, Tesla bot 2025, that's all going to happen there because, and you can then not have to look at what Tesla's also doing, but also what these other guys, OpenAI, uh, Microsoft, yeah. Google, what they're doing. By the way, I have a theory that Andre Karpathy left Tesla and he went to OpenAI and he's actually spying for Elon. Okay. Because, you know, I think Karpathy owns a lot of Tesla stock. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, he so he's probably... like, uh, he's like um, in Godfather 1, the, the, um, the uh, Luca Brasi. Yeah. Right, you have to Luca go Brasi over. with the vicious. Yeah, but he, he went to spy. He said he pretended to be the, the traitor and yeah. going over to, yeah, so... Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was Tesla announced a mega factory in Shanghai. So introduction for those who aren't familiar, Tesla builds this product called Megapack, which is a, the current generation that they've started building is a four megawatt hour battery pack, which for comparison, a Model S has 100 kilowatt hours. So a megawatt hour is 10 Model S's. This is like 40 Model S's of batteries. I think I've got that right. This is like, yeah, yeah it's like, right. like the bat, it's like the same as 40 Model S's. And it, it's like a utility grade backup that you, you they, they, and they deploy like a whole bunch of them to back up like a, a grid. And in theory, and I think there's some small uses of this right now, an office building might have a mega pack, a factory might have a mega pack, a supercharger uh, station with a lot of superchargers might have a mega pack to back up supply of electricity for whatever they're doing so lathrop is lathrop california is the first mega factory and that has already started producing mega packs and they're expecting that to get up to 10 
thousand megapacks a year, which is 40 gigawatt hours a year. They announced Shanghai is going to build a mega factory, and they also said that would build 10,000 megapacks a year. I find it hard to believe that Shanghai won't try to outdo Lathrop. Mm -hmm. I, right. I, you know, it's probably going to be 80, uh, 20,000 mm -hmm. megapacks and 80 gigawatt hours. And I think China is a very large market for mega pack. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think they'll have, and, and the, if you try to order a mega pack right now, I think you're not going to get delivery until 2024, maybe mm -hmm. late 2024, maybe 2025. I haven't looked lately. Mm -hmm. There's huge demand for these. They offer a variety of benefits. So what's your take on the Shanghai mega factory announcement? Mega factory being a large factory that produces mega packs. Yeah. So China has um, among the most um, solar and wind farms, the biggest solar and wind farms, um, mostly I think out towards um, Mongolia and stuff away from the cities and that kind of stuff. But they um able to transmit power via um, a ultra high um, voltage grid. So um, you need to have the, the mega packs to store the ener extra energy that you're generating because uh, in the master plan three, they go over the hourly generation stuff and how there's all this waste of energy where I got to even turn down my, my wind turbines because they're generating too much power and so you have to curtail stuff. So the optimal point apparently Tesla says 30% curtailment. So you want to waste some energy because of um, how they're going, but you do want to minimize that with the mega pack storage. China has pumped hydro where they um, move water up behind a dam. And then when they want to release it, they run through turbines and do some stuff, but that is less controllable than, and, le and less reactive than the, uh, the batteries. When you have so, a sudden demand, a sudden demand for electricity, mega packs can respond instantly. The pump yeah. hydro is going to take minutes. Right, right. So because they have so much of that, then there's this pent up demand for the battery skill stuff in order to make their their grid more efficient. Right. So all that demand is there already. Tesla in the master plan three uh, talked about that um, the fixed mega pack storage for the world in the transition plan should get to 2.3 terawatt hours. So roughly 60 times the size of, of Lathrop. So they have a demand for that level in their master plan. And they also said it costs $10 million per, per gigawatt hour or something like that. Yeah, so, so then the, the 40 gigawatt hour capacity is $400 million. So they gave oh, out it's, some- it's, Sorry. It's $4 million for a mega pack. Sorry, $2 million for a mega pack, which is $500 a, kilo, a kilowatt hour or 500,000 mega, $500 million per gigawatt hour. Mm -hmm. $500 million per gigawatt hour. So mm -hmm. if you do 40 gigawatt hours, you're doing 20. I, I think I calculated that each of these, mega, if they do 10,000 mega packs, you're talking about $20 billion in revenue for each, which mm -hmm. for, for context, Tesla's revenue in 2022 was 80 billion. Mm -hmm. So just one mega pack factory, one mega pack factory is one quarter of Tesla's total revenue from last year. Right. And two of them would be, would be half and, right. and it's only costing them like um, $800 million for both those factories based upon the numbers that they gave in the master plan. Yeah. It's uh, a less like complicated three. product than, I mean, it's more complicated than a car, but it's a $2 million product. Mm-hmm. Right. It's I'm mm -hmm. not even sure it's more complicated than a car because there's mm -hmm. no wheels. Yeah. There's no drivetrain. It's just a yeah. whole bunch of batteries and some electronics. And, and, there's, and the oh, there's, cooling, there's cooling and yeah. Yeah. But the car has cooling. Mm -hmm. The car has electronics. It's like a fairly simple product. It's just and the component costs don't seem to be that high. Like, I think you may end up with more than 50 percent margins. Yep. And yep. maybe even a lot more than 50 percent margins. So these could be really big. And then. Okay, so we see it in China and we see it in the US. We're probably going to see at least one more mega. I, I almost wonder is it, are we going to see more mega factories like this, or is Tesla going to learn from their mega factory production and build a next generation mega factory that produces a higher volume? And you can picture they're going to need at least one of these in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they said 60. So if it's if they get half of the market. You know, other guys do something else, you know, then they, they make 30 of these factories and they'll be like, you know, what, six or eight on each continent, or are you making the 40 gigawatt hour factory 
a 200 gigawatt hour factory, and then you're sh shipping it out from, from there. They converted a, a Target into the Lathrop, um, a, a Target shopping mall into the um, uh, Lathrop factory. So, you know, if these things are not, you know, very easy to, to make. So, and then the total cost of, of the 60 factories, they're talking about like $24 billion. And if they're any more efficient, then, you know, it's, it's be trivial for them to scale up to that demand. So it's a question of like. So a factory you know, that costs less than half a billion dollars is producing $20 billion a year in revenue. Yeah. That's a pretty quick return on investment. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and actually, I, when I think about it, we've got Giga Mexico going up for, for the next generation vehicle. Latin America has notoriously, uh, I don't know if it's all of Latin America, large parts of Latin America have unreliable electricity. Mm -hmm. Costa Rica, for example, has unreliable electricity. I could see, you know, adding mega packs all over Latin America, shoring up their grids. Right. Um, India, probably going to need mega packs. Um, yeah. I, Philippines, Africa, Vietnam. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the rest of Asia. The, the market, the market for mega pack just seems to be endless. Right, and you need them for your mega charging stations for mass rollout of Cybertruck and Semi. Yeah. I need to have the higher, higher um, capacity stuff for that, and I'm gonna mix it in with solar because um, if I take out twenty, if I take out all the trucks, the semi trucks and cyber trucks, that's about twenty three percent of the world oil production, and I need to conversely add twenty percent, thirty percent into electricity. So over the course of two decades, that transition has to happen. So what we're looking at is Lathrop should fully ramp by the end of this year, mm -hmm. be producing 10,000 megapacks a year. Shanghai will probably ramp by the end of next year and maybe more than Lathrop. So we could be looking at $40 billion of revenue in 2025. Mm-hmm. And maybe twenty billion dollars if fifty percent margin. If it was if it was fifty percent margin, be twenty billion dollars in profit and net income. Yeah. So that's a very positive trend for Tesla. All right. Right. So I feel like we've covered a lot of stuff here. Is there? Yep. And you mentioned bot. I don't want to dive into bot right now because I still feel like I think you're right, but I still feel like it's too speculative. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Because we've gone for like two hours. Yeah. Is there anything yep. else you wanted to talk about? One thing is that everyone talks about the twenty million cars, twenty million cars thing. Um, I think one way to look at it, you know, one, I'm not going to try and reduce the, the 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 threshold bar, but I think it needs to be looked at in terms of um, um, the the small car equivalents, right? If if they start making the next gen car, a 25k car, right, then you know if they're making 500,000 semis per year, right, then that's really five million uh, 25k car equivalents. If this only starts two fifty, right? You maybe that, ten right? million. Yeah, maybe ten million, right? So, and then for Cybertruck, then each one's like three. So if I make a million Cybertrucks, then that's like three million small car equivalents. If I'm making um, two million Model Y, that's really four million small yeah, car. I still think they're going for a genuine twenty million units, but right. I, I, know, I know I see your point. Right, right. No, I'm, I'm. I think they're going for twenty million equivalent. I think they they would go in this scenario maybe to forty million of 25K car equivalents or 50 million, whatever. They're going to a higher number, but I just, when you're comparing, you know, like uh, Gary Black talked about the importance of the 25K car, 25K car, you know, making, you know, a million of the um, semi would be equivalent to 10 million of those, right? Right, right. If I make, if I make a 2 million Cybertruck, I'm making 6 million of those. So the relative importance of those is the, yes, I can get to 8 million of those versus, a smaller number of these bigger ones, yeah. the importance to the whole um, thing. And then also it could be, if they're not as slightly less profitable than the semi-truck, you know, then, you know, then you just need to factor that in. So I just, so people should make them equal, compare apples to apples with an equivalency factor. Yeah. And just really quick, it's not a 25K car. Right. Is a twenty thousand dollar or less car, right? They're, they're selling Model Threes in the U.S. for about forty thousand, and in China for I think under thirty five thousand dollars. Right. If they can sell a Model Three in China for thirty five thousand dollars, they'll be able to sell a next generation vehicle for about eighteen thousand dollars in right. China. 
right. and maybe less than that. I think that there, what it's kind of interesting, like, oh, and actually, I, I just realized one other thing I want to talk about, which was a large part that the next generation vehicles, roughly Toyota Corolla sized or a little bigger, which it sounds like it might be a little bigger than a Corolla. There's still a market for smaller vehicles that so far is not in the plan. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the next generation platform is actually going to include a smaller vehicle and a larger vehicle, but you know, like the Honda Fit, the Ta Na the Tata Nano in India, there are some very, very small cars that are sold in very high volume in poorer countries, even mm -hmm. in Europe, I think, mm -hmm. certainly China. I think there has to be one more vehicle on the menu that they haven't mentioned yet. What do you think about the prospect for there being an even smaller vehicle that Tesla's going to make, or is it just they don't think that's going to happen? Um, I think it could happen, but by then, you know, I'm seeing Tesla bots in the factories, I'm seeing robot taxis. So the whole calculus of, of what's going to happen is going to change. Also, because we reduce the cost of transportation, the economy grows, more vehicles are in. So if, you, if you're going to make Tesla bot, which is like um, one thirtieth the size of a Model Y, then why wouldn't you have a um, a micro car at, at 10k, right? But um, if the world can be radically different with uh, robo taxis and and other things, I'm not sure what that looks like. But you know, if they keep dropping cost cutting and saying because they don't stop cost cutting once they make the 20k car, 18k car, they keep going. So then within if they cut out 10 percent per year within five years or 50 percent less then they have a 12k car right? yeah so five years after they would do that so it's just out in 2035 oh somehow beyond the horizon it's too far away but you know like yes i can see that happening within three to five years after they introduce the next gen vehicle be the next next gen vehicle um yeah and they right. want to convert everyone yeah so I, I agree okay so uh i'm gonna wrap it up here yeah i don't have to go but i'm gonna wrap it up anyway okay. um Brian, I want to thank you. Uh, for those watching, Brian is at Next Big Future on Twitter and I think nextbigfuture.com. Brian is yeah. famous or, or very successful in prediction markets. So mm -hmm. when Brian makes predictions, they seem to come true a lot more than when other people make predictions. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you, Brian, so much for coming on. Links thank to you. Brian's stuff in the description below. Uh, for everybody else, please check out the t-shirts, the Tesla Man t-shirt and others at elonbits.com, the stainless steel water bottles. I use these all the time. Mm -hmm. um please check out my other videos please support me on the locals platform on patreon as a youtube channel member or now as a twitter subscriber mm -hmm. and thanks everybody so much for watching